only way we can change the way things are doing is by opening our books, playbooks, SOPs, and running events like this and saying, this is how we do it. We invested about three to $4 million in building out our infrastructure, our SOPs, and our platform. But the only way we can change ecosystems is by giving, opening up, and changing paradigms. Welcome back to the Scaling Fastlane. I'm Valerie Booth, your guide through the strategies to scale your agency at speed. In today's episode, our CEO, Tom Shipley, who is a serial entrepreneur, shares his insights that he's gained over the past two decades of leadership. He'll talk about pushing past perceived constraints to be able to build a bold vision. He shares his mindset tactics for questioning assumptions that restrict us and surrounding yourself with possibility-minded people. He also shares about leading with tenacious optimism, no matter the obstacles ahead. I think you're gonna come away from today refreshed on how to stay focused, how to hire A players during hard times, and how to solve the right problems. Let's listen in. So what I wanna do is just give a little uh, context and I'll start with, I'm gonna share a little bit about what we're doing at Scale of Speed and Ava um, as, a, as a foundation. But before I, I go there, my expectation over the next two days and my hope for you is that we can change paradigms. Yes, there's going to be a lot of tax and strategies you're going to learn, but the biggest thing as leaders and organization is, is what are the strategies can shift our mindsets and how can we leave this event in two days, a different person than entered this journey. And I'm going to say it is possible. I've seen it over and over again, but the question is, is, um, um, are you ready to lean in? And I suggest that you lean in as far as you can take what you take, what you can here, and it'll be a great journey. Um, just a little context as far as because some people really know the context of what we're doing and the and the organization and other people are coming here and says, I don't really understand what Ava and Scale at Speed is. So uh, for a few people, this will be redundant, but let me give you context. Felix, Peter and I got together to transform the way rollups and aggregation is done, especially in the advertising agency world. The roll up in the roll up and what we look at 198 of the 200 largest agencies in the world are all holding companies and roll up that were built from roll ups. If you look at uh, Dentsu, one of the largest one, they were founded in 1902. WPP, they basically started their tear in the 1980s. And the way uh, aggregation roll ups are done are financially brilliant. And that's why. You buy companies at a lower multiple, you put them into your platform, and then you basically enjoy a multiple arbitrage. You bought them for three to five X, and right now they're in your platform and you're worth 10X of, of, of times your EBITDA or your net income. And therefore, you're already enjoying that multiple. And then what happens is, um, what's interesting is you create this deals construct with the owners, but because of you have founders, entrepreneurs that are going into organizations that are extremely hierarchical and they're given typically the first two years, very little support. They're suddenly for the first time you have a boss that's keeping you accountable with numbers and what I call sharp elbows. And with this type of pressure and all the joys and the restrictions you have, lack of support, yet you see that your clients are being poached by other divisions of these larger companies. And after within, what, I, what we've seen is 80% of founders never stay for their earnout. While they thought they got a decent price for their business since they don't stay for the earnout, now for the company that bought it, the, uh, the M&A teams and the analysts and the financial teams, it's a brilliant move and it's a brilliant structure. When they leave, half the team leaves, which means lower payroll. When they, and the culture's gone, third of the clients leave, but it doesn't matter. Financially, it makes sense. And as we were talking last night is, it's a destruction of enterprise value. It's a, it's a destruction of legacy. And to me, it's, it's a destruction and it's erosion the way Peter Felix and I uh, viewed it as people are human capital and there has to be a better way to do it. There, and especially, the, it is no longer the 1980s or 90, 1990s. There are better ways of doing things and people are wiser, they're smarter, they're more educated. They understand what's gonna happen and people are looking for a better way. And we said, we can build that model. So what we're doing when we're doing our acquisition with our acquisition partner, a platform, which is Agency Ventures Aggregator, or we just call it AVA for short. What we're doing is we're acquiring agencies and we're looking for healthy growing agencies 
that want that believe the best years are ahead of them. And what we want to do is we want to surround them to resources they couldn't afford. We're going to implement Felix's 2Y3X methodology, or as you see the book, Scale of Speed, which is all about building the succession team from within the agency and have them drive the future of the organization. Because the secret that we came up with is if we can buy agencies and help them do what he's done to 32 agencies in a row, double or triple their revenue and their profitability within two years, and we don't have to run anything, insert it, we're just providing them resources, we win and the team wins and the founders live. And depending on what the agenda of the founders are, if they want to leave within a year, we'll help them to transition. If they want to transition to a different role in the organization or with their agency, from what they're doing day to day, we can help support them with them. If they want to do exactly what they want to be doing for the next five years, then they're great. It makes it easy on us. It doesn't matter. It all starts with what the agenda of the team and the organization is. And also the things that we're very plugged into, into and you'll hear us talk about is values. Most organizations we do not acquire because they don't align with our values. Um, we try to be transparent, we try to be open, and that's the way we are. So that's the foundation of what we do. And our goal is to acquire anywhere from six to 12 agencies a year. I'll be sharing about um, a little, if you want to hear how over the next 60 days we're acquiring four agencies and integrating them. And, and so a new structure we're doing on that. I'll share with you a little bit later on that. Um, but that's really, we can't, but we can't impact the ecosystems of agencies with only that many acquisitions. So the only way we can change the way things are doing is by opening our books and saying, and opening up our playbooks and our SOPs and saying, and running events like this and saying, this is how we do it. I know it's crazy uh, that people view the, when you spend, I guess last year we invested about three to $4 million in building out our infrastructure, our SOPs and our platform and our team out. So the concept after this level of investment for us to go and say, here it is. Most people would think we're insane, but the only way we can change ecosystem is, is by giving, opening up, and changing paradigms, which is why I'm really thrilled yours. And most people here are from the agency world, some people are not, but whatever it is, what we're teaching the foundations really doesn't matter. The one thing I want you to think about is, as CEOs and as leaders, we have responsibilities. And the question that I have for each one of you is looking back 20 years from now, how are you gonna view the next chapter of your life starting today? And the next chapter is today and the next five years. I view life as, in general, is this great epic novel that I, that I have a responsibility to write and make it epic. And every chapter counts. And for me, every chapter is five years. But for me, 20 years from now is, what are the defining moments that you're gonna create? What are the decisions you're gonna make that make the next five years one that you look back and say, I'm really proud of it. I didn't squander those times. I took advantage of it, whether it's my family, my relationships, and my team, and what I had in front of me, and how could I use leverage to do it and compress time in ways that reduces the pressure and noise. Because I don't believe that, um, yes, I think that, I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Martell, but he talks about many of us entrepreneur archetypes. Ours were, um, we're hunters, we like to accomplish things. Um, and therefore, uh, we love to just get shit done. And sometimes we do it just by grinding. But sometimes there's better ways of doing it. And so the question is, what is the highest, best use of your time as a CEO? And it's something we should be asking about our team, but we should be very protective about our time. We should figure out a way to remove the pressure and the noise in our lives to be able to focus on one as leaders and transformational leaders. What can we do to have the biggest impact as well as to reduce the pressure noise so we can, when we're not at work, we can give the best to the people around us. And we only have one shot at this. And I don't know if I have one more. Okay, just a little side. I came up with a couple new philosophies over the last couple of years. Number one is that I came up with a laundry list of people I wanted out of my life and a laundry list of characteristics of people I wanted in my life. And then I looked at it and I said, let me keep it really simple. I want people that I want to surround myself with that give me energy. Because when everything on my list comes up, some people suck the energy out of me. Some people give me energy and make my life better. And typically those are people that want impact, people that are generative, people that still have a fire in them to accomplish things, and people that are just good natured. And so there's people that just give me energy. So that's where one of the criteria is uh, that, that, I, that I set out. 
And so as we try to curate the rooms that we have, as we try to surround ourselves, because it helps us think of different level. We'll talk also about your teams. If you look at your team, who on your teams, I view, you know, um, I see A players and Bs and Ds and Es, and I'm gonna say that it is easy to fire people that are doing horrible work. I don't care what their heart is, it's easier to follow, so fire them. Very, very mediocre people that are joining the organization down or have negative attitude, easier to fire. What's really hard is people that are good harder that are doing mediocre work, B, I'm gonna say B and B minus players, that are bringing down the standards of your organization. And we make excuses for them for a thousand reasons. But the reality is, is they're holding you back and they're holding your team back. It is painful for people that have been with you a long time, but I can tell you this, that you're doing a disservice to your team, you're doing a disservice to you, you're doing a disservice for your legacy, and you're doing a disservice for them. I have let people go that were extremely mediocre in my organization, and when they and I feel that I've over-indexed into giving training, support, and excuse the expression, but love to my team, but sometimes, People don't work best in that environment. And when they go to a different environment, it's ones they can excel in, they excel. And basically, don't think because you're the best employer in the world that it's the best place for everyone, because it's not. And so finding that right fit, so we have a responsibility not only to surround ourselves with those generative people, if that's what you want, but in your organization as responsibility as CEO, we have the responsibility to constantly be recruiting on a regular basis, fill our people and upgrading the people in our team. We reward loyalty. But also, we need people that want to constantly learn. When someone says that, I've been here for seven years, I do what I do, and I don't want to learn anymore, well, you know something? If they're doing a great job and what they're doing, okay, but if they're not, because I, the world is evolving too fast. The world of AI is going to be changing our organizations, our agencies, our company in a very drastic way. Our team needs to learn and grow. It's like in the year, in the 1990s, people had said, these computer things, I don't like computers. I got a little crazy thinking back the way it was, but people had that attitude. The same thing with technology and learning and growth. And the only way we can be competitive is if not only we're learning, we have a creative learning organization, there's this passion that's there. So what I can, um, and the room will be filling up over the next two days. People will be um, coming and excited for you to meet a lot of the people that will be showing up. So. There are people with agencies that are $10 million agencies and 15, and some people with one and $2 million agencies. But I can promise you this, that somewhere in this room, there's two $2 million agencies. And if we look at it, same capability, same opportunities, one's gonna sell for a million and a half dollars somewhere between the next one to five years, and another $2 million agency is gonna sell for a 15 to $20 million exit. The only difference is, is the one, the biggest challenge is, did the agency owner lean all in, understand how to understand strategy, question the strategy they're, they're taking and leverage the learnings they're doing and surround themselves with people that can help them grow. So we're gonna go through exercises where I'm gonna give you a blueprint on how you, if you have a $2 million uh, agency, without a lot of difficulty and reducing the pressure and the noise, how you can create a $15 million exit. You can add a zero on and do a $150 million exit. We can go through that and we will a little bit. But the question is, is, is taking, it's understanding the highest and best use of your time as a CEO and really focusing on those efforts and not the stuff that really don't, doesn't matter. Um, just context as far as a background. Many people, some people in the room know my background, other people don't. So for context is that, um, Grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, in Orlando, Florida. At the age of 20, I decided that Florida State is great. Fraternity was a really cool thing. But really, at this point in my life is, life had to be more than this. Life had to be more, I need to have a bigger impact. And being raised Jewish and having been to Israel um, uh, twice in my life, I had this connection to this very young country that was the homeland and I wanted to have an impact to the continuation of this very young country and decided to move to Israel at the age of 20. I didn't know the language, do nothing about the army. And I remember I, unfortunately for my dad, showed up from college one day and dad said, what are you doing here? I said, I wanna let you know that I'm moving to Israel at the end of the semester and gonna put 
university on pause and I'm going to join the Israeli army. And he said, why? I explained to him. He's, and he begged me to not do that. And then he said, Tom, let's face it. You kind of run, but you're not that athletic. You don't know anything about the language. So when you, and you don't know about the army. So where do you, you get there? What are they going to do? Make you a bureaucrat, best case? Well, I love to be underestimated. So I moved to Israel, found out about, uh, about the top four special uh, forces units in the army. One of them is focused on rescue, rescuing civilians and enemy and um, civilian as well as um, soldiers across enemy lines or anywhere throughout the world. And that's what captured my heart is that level of impact. And then the numbers started. Let's start with this. And I'm going to share that what I'm about to share with you, these numbers, there is no different from a $5 million company or agency that lasts over five years. So it starts with this, there's 70,000 combat soldiers in the army. Of the 70, 10,000 try to get into my unit. 10,000 go through a battery test on different days and psychometric, psychotechnic, physical tests. They picked a thousand of us for Hell Week. And then Hell Week, they try to measure a lot of things and they know that the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna break you down physically, you can't do anymore. But that's when they start to really test you to see what you're really made of. And um, at the end of the seven days, they picked, uh, out of the thousand of us, they picked 25 of us to go through an 18 month course. Out of that 25 of us, 13, uh, 18 months later, there were 13 of us. What the foundations of what I learned in the Israeli Special Forces is what I found was key to be a successful entrepreneur. One of the things that they taught, I remember during this Gibush, it's the seven day where they put you through hell week and they try to break you. And I say seven days, they don't tell you how many days it is. It's again, part of the psychological games. After several days and nights of barely sleeping, they finally let us just fall asleep in these tents. So just fell down, I'm laying there and suddenly the firecrackers and gunshots go off. They pull us out and they set us up into two really long lines and we can barely stand up at this point. And then uh, to the line on the right is where they put me and I was waiting and I was waiting for about 20 minutes. I'm falling asleep and they said, okay, out about thousand yards. We want you to run as fast as you can. When you get straight, you're going to see a nightstick. When you see that phosphorus nightstick stick, and I was still translating things. My Hebrew was not good at that time, but they said, we want you to do hundred pushups. So I ran there as fast as I could, and they said, we're going to time you. I ran, and I went and did 100 push-ups. I got done, and I went, was that 99 or 100? I said, shit, I don't know. Let me get two more down. I put two more, and I ran back as fast as I could, and they timed me. The next morning, we woke up. They called 15 people's names. The 15 people showed up up front. They didn't know why they called out. They said, um, you're out. We had someone out there with night goggles checking to see if you did your 100 push-ups. A lot of people just went out there. No one's watching. It's in the middle of the dark and did nothing. They said, if we cannot trust you when no one's watching, how can we put people's lives on line and sometimes you're operating alone? And what my lesson from that was, and it doesn't matter special forces, it matters in my teams is the most important element we have is trust. We have to pick people that we trust their capability, their capacity, and we trust their heart. If not, it's gonna erode the confidence in your team. And when you go over is, you know who you trust and you know who you don't. Now, sometimes certain entrepreneurs were too paranoid and maybe that's why we don't trust. Then that's an issue on us and we have some work to do. But in general, trust is the foundation of every, uh, of every great team. And quick, so after just quick background on myself is, after that, and I felt I had an unfair advantage because basically I had a new definition of what difficult was. So I was getting my two degrees in industrial engineering when I came back. I, um, I started my first couple startups in 1999, amazing year, one web 1.0. I started my first omni-channel brand. Uh, we sold a lot online through the store of the platform we built from scratch. We had 15 pages in the SkyMall catalog. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Garrett, uh, Garrett is here and you're gonna get a chance to know each other. Um, Garrett's has had a fabulous career, but his first job, were well, you in college at that time still? In, in, he was an intern for me at the T. Shipley catalog in 1999, and so employee number one. And then when my wife was pregnant with our with our second daughter, they were there packing boxes when I was at CES. It was a wild it was a wild ride, but again, 15 pages, Sky Mall, millions of catalog shipped out every month. It was a great omni-channel platform, 
And then um, after, a couple, um, after a couple years running that, we did some acquisition. And then we saw that, that the platform off to a group out of New Jersey. Um, after three years of, of consulting, I said, why don't I take this exact same playbook and apply this to a beauty, the beauty industry where we told you will never be able to build an iconic beauty, again, you will never be able to. You'll never be able to build an iconic beauty brand using direct response marketing, which now we know is stupid, but back then it was, it's either through PR or again, 2005, or it's through 100 or $200 million launch budgets. That's who, that was the formulas that were done. And we said that makes no sense. And with that, myself and my partner in a small attic in Richmond, Virginia, started this company and we went all in financially to generate $331,000 of sales at first year. Two years later, we did 125 million. Over the life of that first brand, Hydroxetone, that we incubated over our kitchen table, we did over a billion dollars in revenue. We did a number of different other brands, including Christy Brinkley, uh, Brinkley Beauty. Our most iconic brand is Karenique, which is still the leader in the women's hairy growth uh, niche. And you'll find it at Ulta, CVS, Rite Aid, but the core of that business is still direct response. Um, fast forward, sold that portfolio of brands off to private equity. Uh, during COVID, rather than watching um, um, Tiger King, I said, and here's the key thing here, is I started, I called a friend of mine here in Austin, and I was living in New Jersey, and I said, let's do something fun, Brian. I said, let's go buy an Amazon or e-com brand. We said, great, let's do that. We started looking around. And then I started thinking at a zero. Hey, Brian, instead of buying one Amazon or e-com brand, what do you think about buying 10? Huh, that sounds like I'm in, let's do it. Thinking about it, I picked the phone the next day and said, Brian, instead of building a platform for 10 Amazon e-com brands, why don't we do 100? And he went, I'm in. So then I went through my operating assumptions and I knew that was going to be a complete failure. On what everything I learned in order to run multiple brands simultaneously at one time and doing one to five acquisitions a month and I knew it would explode. So then I went back and I rebuilt all my operating assumptions saying what would have, and the key question is, is what would have to be true to make that possible? It's a very powerful question that was formulated by a Harvard professor. What would have to be true to make that possible? So then I started rebuilding my operating assumptions. And we all, in all our businesses, we have the operating assumptions that we believe are true. And I'm going to segue for a second. Those operating assumptions, if your businesses right now have been growing consistently by 10, 15, 20% a year, first of all, you're here in this room because you have successful businesses. And I applaud everyone. If your businesses are growing by 10, 15, 20%, the reason why they're not growing faster than that is because your operating assumptions are stuck in the past. Because you, there's things in your head that are holding you back that are, we have these, again, as people we've gone through traumas, I mean, they find an entrepreneur that doesn't have trauma in their life. So, and I have my, I have a, I have my book on traumas but not that other people don't have more than me, but we all have traumas. But those traumas, our brains teach us how to keep things safe and we keep rules in our head and we have these loops that are going on. But those loops that protect us also hold us back. And the question is, is what tricks can we play? What strategies can we employ to change those loops that are keeping us held back? So one of the things I do is I add zeros to ideas. Not that I'm going to go and execute my idea when I had two zeros onto it, but it forces me to change my paradigm. It changes, to, forces me to question my operating assumption and think differently. And then when I s develop that plan and saying, okay, with Foundry Brands is we develop this plan and what would be have need to be possible in order to do this type of doing one to three acquisitions a month without the whole, everything exploding. Then I, with that and my new operating assumptions, I went out and met with six private equity firms. I got five term sheets between 50 and $100 million. I put, took my two favorite private equity firms, put them together to raise $100 million to launch Foundry Brands. Now, I remember going back my first company, which was a consulting agency that I built well before T. Shipley uh, with Garrett is, I thought, oh my God, could I ever get to a million dollars? My next business with T. Shipley, oh my God, can I ever get to $10 million? 
And then the thought of ever getting to a $100 million company was so outside of my range. But then I changed my operating assumptions and I surrounded myself with different people that knew that how to do it and how to make it possible. And that's the way we got to the $100 million a year with Atlantic Coast Brands. And it's just zeros. And then this question is, how do we create a billion dollar exit? The numbers sound so stupid. It's almost, what do you mean a billion dollar exit? But it's math and then it goes back to operating assumptions. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna say, and they're all numbers. If someone has a half million dollar agency, loves their life and they want to figure out a way to get to the million, good for them. And basically, if I can help them get to that level, I will. If they want to build a 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, if they, the other philosophy that I picked up, maybe it's in Israel I picked it up in Startup Nation is that I believe every entrepreneur who's willing to take the risk should have three liquidity events in their life. And sometime with your core business that you love so much that you don't want to leave your team, you can have three liquidity events through your core business also. But I would love to see every entrepreneur have three liquidity events in their life that creates diagnostic wealth that creates that so they can have impact that they want to. Because ultimately, there's a lot of things that drive us. Some of this is private need that we have, but sometimes it is also that we know that it's not about the dollars accumulating the bank because you can only have the impact to your family so much. But the question is, is what impact can we have? How can we leverage that for impact? And against all the way we have our scorecards in life. But I know this, that part of the way I rewired my mind many, many years ago was that at the my last day on earth, whether it's a year from now or whether it's 30 years from now, what I want to say is, did I have the impact? Did I have the impact for the people that came into my life? And did I have the maximum positive impact on this earth? Again, that's my agenda, and I don't put my judgment on anyone, but that's it. The other concept that is that I adopted a few years ago is I've come to terms that sometimes we can have diametrically opposed beliefs and philosophies that can go together. One of them is I'm convinced I only have a year left to live. I'm also convinced that my favorite decade in life is going to be in my 80s. And everything I'm doing right now is to training my body and my mind for the best decade of my life. Now again, two diametric, and what does that mean for me it is, I'm not gonna squander my life over the next year. And again, people say live like it's your last day on earth. Well, again, I would do things differently as my last day or last hour than my last year. I'm not gonna squander opportunities with the people that I love and that I wanna spend time with and give up a year of my life for things I hate doing. On the other hand is, I'm going to be playing the long game because that's life and I can have a bigger impact and have a better journey. So again, these are just my things and some of the rules I picked up, but I found that it's helped me become a better leader. The final thing I'll share with you is the, about adding zeros to ideas. The final thing about adding zeros to ideas is the bigger the vision, the easier it is. What? That sounds contradictory. I created a vision for Founder Brand. It was so big and so audacious that I started talking to some leaders at Amazon, including the guy that built out the Amazon, the head of technology on the Amazon marketplace, who I could blame for the buy box idea and concepts and everything else. But, and I was able, we were able to recruit him on from Amazon onto our team as the head of technology and our CTO because it was a big idea. The team we were able to recruit, the strategic relations that we were able to do, the technology we had access to, and finally, raising $100 million because the idea was big enough. Now again, it, had, it can't be crazy where someone's saying, well, there's no plan to execute, so you're just, you're just an idiot, okay? There had to be logic behind it that, I could, that basically made sense but sometimes with people, it's about vision. The other thing that I've learned as, as a leader is, a, a buddy of mine was working for um, some high growth e-com business. They, were, they, they went fast from 10 million to 50 million. And Brian was his right-hand guy. And he one time took him to, they were out in Phoenix. He said, Brian, I wanna take you here. And he took him to the side of the hill. He said, see that plot of land? He said, I'm building my dream home right here. I wanna share it with you because all the success we had, I get to build my dream home. And my friend Brian said, I'm killing myself so he can build his dream home. What's the vision and why am I part of this organization? And the world has shifted from 50 years ago where we all have and our teams have 
bigger expectations and want to be part of impact. So ultimately, the clearer, the bigger the vision, the clearer the vision we can, team, we can share with our team and the reason why our organization exists and why we're creating really something special is the way you build that loyalty and the dedication of a team. And therefore, sometimes by adding zeros, it can be easier. Final thing I want to share with you is um, one of the core things that I learned in the IDF was about the power of grit and tenacity. Because I remember that first day standing up for the Gibush on that seven days of hell, and I looked to my right. These guys were monsters, and some of the most these guys were athletes. There was a guy actually that was uh, trying to get onto the Olympic team for swimming. So again, these guys were just incredible athletes. And what I learned as every day passed and these guys were going down and not getting up and quitting every day was that ultimately we're all here and we get tested. And as entrepreneurs, no one knows tests like we do because there are days we're sitting at the edge of a cliff where everyone tells us you're done. I can't tell you how many times that my board has told me we're done and we should quit. My team had told me there's no way out of it. And meanwhile, with the little momentum that we have is we're really scrappy, we're really creative and we never fucking give up. And we find a way out over and over again. So what I learned there is grit and tenacity and never giving up. So at Atlanta Coast Brands, we had our things where we had some great years, we had some challenges here. 2015 was a rough year for us. We got out of, we crawled our way out of it. And by 2018, we were rocking again. And while our revenues were a little bit lower, we were making um, at that point about 600,000 in profit a month. And so we were feeling really good about ourselves, but we had iconic for beauty brands and we had private equity groups that are knocking on our door and giving us nice offers for the business. We got three term sheets that September of 2018, one for 55 million, one for 65 and one for 75 million. And we're feeling really good. And finally, you know, we're thinking about the future and the family and the impact and what we're going to do next. And it's really great. October 7th, 2018, we got the phone call from our manufacturer. It was the sole manufacturer for our FDA approved product that was in every continuity system that was going out. And with a $500 million manufacturer, bankrupt chapter seven, doors locked. We can't get access to our product, our components. Forget about that is they're the only company in the whole world that is authorized by the FDA to make this product. And we can get authorized again, starting from scratch in 18 months. What happens if you don't ship your continuity customers after 30 days? Cancels, 60 days. How much are left after 90 days? And how many people, when you lose most of your continuity customers, once you get supply back, because it took us 90 days to find a new manufacturer, to get them certified, get it FDA approved and up and running, from and the and the and ANDA transferred uh, basically is by that period of time it's very difficult to even get back five or ten percent of your customers. We went from making six hundred thousand dollars a month to losing six hundred thousand dollars a month. Two months later, the uh, two months later, our bank called up that basically we had two levels of debt. We were all in, and we got the call that said, "You guys are um, done. We're shutting you off." And basically, we're calling our loan because we know we can liquidate your brands. We can cover our, we don't really care about anything else. And with that, I went to a mastermind event in Boise, Idaho. And it was my first event there. And I was new, I was the largest company in this, inner, in this group of this inner circle. And so I was gonna go in there and share what I knew and great increasing my network. And I went in and I remember that morning, it was a cold day in Boise. It was kind of spitting, you know, those days where it's just kind of, humid and you just feel the mist cutting through the air and I was running with my wife with Pam and we're running along the Boise on the Boise River and and I said Pam can we go to a very dark place she said if you want to sure and my wife's um, psychotherapist if you ever watch billions and see Dr. Wendy Rhodes that's Pam <laughs> so it always has been so Pam said if you want to go there let's go what's going on she knew what's going on but she had me state the fact I said uh, we lost most of our piece of our continuity. We're losing six in a month. And she said, and what's happening now? I said, the bank just called our mezzanine lender, said they're cutting us off and they're basically going to take over everything and liquidate. And I said, she said, then what? I said, well, we're personally guaranteed on our $14 million line under that. She said, and then what? I said, well, with that and then not getting paid basically is we're gonna lose everything we have and we'll probably owe some money to the IRS. She said, and then what? I said, we're losing the house, may or may not keep the cars. She says, and then what? I said, then we're 
moving to an apartment. She said, then what? I said, worst of all, a thousand people in our ecosystem are gonna lose their jobs. She said, and then what? I said, well, then we're starting in. She says, and then what? She said, I said, well, five years from, she said, where are we at five years from now? I said, looking at selling our next company for about a $50 million exit. She said, so what are you worried about? So with that, I went into this, you know, this, um, this mastermind meeting with 50 strangers that I didn't know. And I said, let me tell you what's going on with my company. What advice do you have? And then boom, boom, people started throwing ideas. Some ideas were just stupid. But even the worst ideas created that kernel, that inkling of idea that got me thinking. Some were great ideas and I wrote them all down. Then I picked up the phone and I said, I'm not embarrassed. And I called uh, friends, Roland, uh, Roland Frazier, Perry Belcher, Ryan Dice. I said, here's my situation, what do you got? I said, and I need help here. So they, I said, and if you had, I said, if you had one bullet left in your gum, you needed the best media buyer ever, who would you turn to? And they said, that's easy. We want you to, we'll introduce you to Alex Herndon, who will be here a little later, who's an investor in Ava. And we got to work and I found vendors to open up new channels like Brett Curry who opened up YouTube for us. And the team, we prioritized the team, what, and this was key. We had our laundry list of a thousand of, of about 200 things that could have impact and we prioritized them by three criteria. One is, and if you think of a quadrant, is we're always shooting for the upper right. The top right is things that have a big impact, things that don't require a lot of resources, either financially or time, and have, and then we did circles around those with the highest probability of success. So again, you, that's how you get leverage as CEOs. We look for things that have massive impact, don't require a lot of resources and high probability of success. And every week we did it and we ran the business by the numbers. And every week we read the numbers, we read the test because of direct response and we grinded. And I can tell you when I announced this to the team and shared the team where we were and I fired the CMO because he said, I got nothing left. I said, then I'm taking your job. And two people, we had two people who said, we didn't sign up for this and they left. They were amazing people, but they didn't, they said, we didn't sign up for this and they left. Then I hired two superstars who came in because even when you are in scarcity, it doesn't mean you should not have an abundance mindset. So we hired two superstars. The team got together. They rolled up their sleeves and they said, let's, let's, let's do it. And the next 12 months were the best 12 months in business in my life. We went from a $600,000 loss to an $800,000 a month profit. Okay. And we eventually sold the brands off. Okay. So again, it's who we are as entrepreneurs. It is that resilience, it's tenacity, it's knowing that when people say that you're done, there's no such thing as done. Sometimes though, and this is key, sometimes we're so busy grinding, uh, working our way and white knuckling it up this wall when the answer is right here. And I'll share one more uh, quick story because I'm running out of time is that, um, Garrett, we never talked about this, is that in hindsight, you realize something is, we had, our business was direct to consumer and we did catalogs and market online. And so we focused and we had the greatest team for that we have uh, from an analytics and marketers on how we did direct response and catalog marketing. And we were so focused on how we can optimize and reduce our cost per order and increase the amount of contribution into our company to get us to a proper level that I didn't realize that we had this other business and it was most of our business. We had this nice little business called our B2B business and where our average order went from 150 to $3,500. But we had customers that call in and said, hey, I don't want one briefcase or one portfolio. I want 100 or 200. What I didn't realize till years later was that what I really didn't have, it wasn't a direct response B2C business that I had. I had a B2B business with a break-even lead gen funnel. But the real money was on the B2B business. If I would have staffed and focused on that B2B business, that's how we could have gotten to that 100 million and, and actually cash flowed everything ourselves. We were so fi focused on just climbing that wall when the answer, the open window was right to the right. And that's just something to think as, an organization, as, as entrepreneurs is, we grind and we never give up, but occasionally we need to take a step back and breathe and look at the opportunities because sometimes it's the same business, it's the same vision, it's just a different path to get there. Now what I'm not gonna cover today and from, um, 
is a lot of the lessons that I've learned along the way, more than happy to share it with you, um, that could create times and compress, uh, you know, compress time for you. But let me just share, because I'm stealing, I have three, three minutes and 30 seconds. I'm gonna share one final story, if that's okay. But it's one of the most profound lessons I learned and it's one of the most important questions that every team member, employee, CEO should always be asking. So I was in uh, I was in grad school, and the graduate project we were given was as industrial engineers. I was the CEO, or the head of industrial engineering at Taco Bell, called the head of our department, and he said, "Listen, I need a graduate team to work on a project. What we're doing is." We're reducing the footprint of our Taco Bells because we want to reduce the construction costs as we're doing this massive build out nationwide and expansion. And to do that is we have a, we have a storage problem is that the storage units are very inefficient. We want your team to come in and redesign ergonomically um, and more compressed storage systems that can work in our stores. So that's the task we were given and we did classic um, industrial engineering studies. We measured, we looked at inventory, inventory flow. So it was just, um, a great exercise we did and we said we got all the data and we said well how are we going to start this and, I, we, and so myself and a member of the, member of the team said Dr. Rogers Dr. Rogers is the best system thinker, thinker we have in the department let's go and talk to him so he went to the four of us went to Dr. Rogers classroom where he was working and he was done with his class and we said can you, we ask you questions can you help us out with our project he said sure go have a seat so the four of us sit in the front row and then Dr. Rogers says, well, tell me what the problem is. So we said, okay, Dr. Rogers. Taco Bell wants to expand nationwide. They want to uh, drastically increase the pace that they're actually investing in new footprints, but they want to reduce the size of their footprint to reduce the, uh, the, the cost for every, every built out. They know that they have a storage problem. They want us to redesign their storage and that's the test that we've gone and we've gone and we've measured what they have and what the velocity is. And we see that they have some products that are coming in there large, some are small, some are there that are four week supply, others are two week supplies, other that are one day supply and PepsiCo refills these three times, redelivers every three days to these stores. And so we're looking at different types of, uh, of, of, of units that can handle these variable type of productions. And we're looking at the flow of the stores where to actually put things from a flow perspective, he said, What's the problem? Dr. Roger has this long hair and he has this long beard. And so he said, okay, Dr. Rogers, what's going on is Taco Bell wants to expand nationwide and they want to go and they want to compress their footprint and they want to, they're having these deliveries and they're coming in three times a week and some are large, some are small and some have one day supply, some have five days supply. And we're looking at this type, he said, he stopped me like this. He said, Tom, what's the problem? So I said, Taco Bell is trying to expand nationwide. They want to reduce the size of the cost. And I just kept on going down every time, repeating it. And as I got to the same point, he said, stop. What's the problem? <laughs> Dr. Rogers. I'm thinking this guy's a fucking idiot, OK? Dr. Rogers, Taco Bell wants to expand nationwide. They want to put another 500 stores on this year. They're trying to reduce the cost of investment. They want to reduce the size of their footprint. And I go through this again. And Dr. Rogers, who's six foot six, stands up. And for the first time, he says, so Dr. Rogers says, what's the problem? And this quiet spoken man who's six foot six, his arm starts getting longer, starts yelling, what's the problem? Dr. Rogers, Taco Bell, and I go through this again. And then he starts, his arm starts going out. He says, what's the problem? And I go, Dr. Rogers, and I go through the problem again. And he's there saying, but what's the problem? And now his head's going up and down and now he's not even letting me talk and he's screaming what's the problem and spits coming out of his mouth. His beard is going every direction. His hair is falling out of every direction. He's screaming what's the problem? And I said, Taco Bell has an inventory management issue because they're ordering some products for a month, some products for a day and they're getting deliveries three times a week and that's why they need some space. He said, he sits down and puts his light back on. He said, yeah. So sometimes we're focused on what we think the problem is. We don't know what the real problem is. We're looking at the symptoms and we're looking at other data. And our jobs as CEOs, and we have to train our teams to ask the question, what's the problem? And make sure we're solving the right problem and not solving the system. 
So that lesson I learned from Dr. Raj is one, one of the top things I do. So another time, we'll sh if you want to, we'll talk about some of the other lessons. But um, enjoy the next two days. The learning is epic. And I'm going to share this is that we're teaching context on how to maximize the value of your agency when you're ready to sell. Whether it's one year from now or whether you're selling your agency five years from now, it really doesn't matter. And your business should always be in a great position to sell because it'll make the life, because basically it's kind of like uh, the TV show, Love It or List It, right? Same thing is I want to make it so beautiful that I don't want to sell it, but it will optimize value. So it really doesn't matter. And you're indifferent from that perspective. Okay. So we're going to be sharing that with you. We'll be, of course, we're going to be talking about, and Peter will, about acquisitions because we believe you can solve most every problem. He's going to say every problem but most every problem through M&A and through acquisitions, but it creates significant opportunity for growth and scale and increasing the value of your business for when you're having your exit. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Scaling Fastlane podcast. If you enjoyed this content and are looking for a more immersive experience, join us at the next Scale at Speed live event. It's packed with dynamic content, expert insights, and a room full of like-minded, action-oriented agency leaders. Come elevate your scaling journey in person. Visit scaleatspeedlive.com to ensure your spot today. We can't wait to see you there.